to me, you can't talk about life balance without talking about health in regards to the body and the mind. And we focus, especially in talking about arthritis and autoimmune diseases, so much emphasis is put on the body and what can we do to heal the body. And I want to incorporate a little bit of mind in that because I think without that balance, um, we're not going to find true healing through this. So, in balancing your life, I mean, I love these, there's so many interpretations of balance. I can't do either of those, okay? Um, but I'd like to be able to, it looks fabulous. But in talking about balance, again, I want to talk about not only the balance of your whole life, but also the balance inside you of the body, mind, and spirit. The body we talk about all the time, it's the physical being, it's our health, our activity, if we're in pain or not. But then the mind is also our thoughts, our emotions. And then we have to put spirit in there, which gives us peace and strength. And it's an anchor for a time for us when we're having trouble times. I'm not talking about religion, but I'm talking about having that spiritual belief system that can carry you through tough times. And in talking about these things, I think we absolutely have to talk about stress. Because to me, stress is the key to help, help deal with stress better. So on each of your places, there's a little card with little black dots called bio dots. Yeah, I saw you can play with those earlier. It's not a bindi, don't put it on your forehead. <laughs> <laughs> but what's neat about bio dots is this was introduced to me when I was at Harvard. And so I'm going to do Liz, who was the woman that talked to us about the bio dots. She was this woman with this crazy red hair and this funky outfit, and you couldn't tell right off if she was a fashion model or a homeless person. And she had like, you know, five skirts and stockings and this kinky, curly red hair, and I loved her. She was fabulous. But she, she says to us, she goes, take the bio dots, put one on your non-dominant hand. So go ahead and do that. The bio dot is a very sensitive measure of temperature. And studies have shown that when you're stressed, your hands get colder. When you're relaxed, your hands and feet are warmer. Now, this room is sort of cold, so the dot might not change color, but as you relax, as you get warm, the dot will progress to a green, to a yellow, to a blue, to a purple, and that means you're relaxed. Please do not come up to me at lunch and tell me your dot is broken. <laughs> the dots do not break. I swear, it's not broken. You're just stressed. <laughs> do not do this. <laughs> that is cheating. Do not walk around like this. That's cheating. Do not worry about the other person's dot. <laughs> worry about your own dot. And at that moment, she looked at me and said, it's not a competition. Because <laughs> even in that moment, she could tell, I was going to win. I was going to have a purple dot if I killed you, right? Well, all day long, all day long, my dog was black. And I'm looking at other people's dots and going, it, 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 my, She's screwing with me. My dog's broken. I swear to God, she gave me a broken dog. And I was seriously starting to think my dog was broken, even though she said it couldn't be broken. So I leave the, uh, the workshop that day, and I'm a dancer. I do hip hop. And I found a place in Boss where I could go dance, because I thought I'm not going to be able to go a week without doing this. So I got my dog on right up in the taxi, and I'm looking at this thing, and it's still black, and I kind of think I'm nuts. And I get to dance class, and I don't know anybody. And I don't know this class, and I don't know this teacher, and I'm thinking, oh, this is a little nerve wracking. Can I keep up? Do, you know, they're all looking at me like, who are you and why are you dressed like that? Because I'm dressed like California and they're dressed Boston. Very different outfit. Um, and about halfway through class, I do the swoop in thing and I see my dots change color. And I was like, yes! And I'm like, So my dot goes to this purple color and then it goes black again. So I'm like, well, I'm not stressed out. What is what? It's broken again. What is wrong with this dot? What I realized is I got overheated. And the dot can only detect so much temperature. So my dot, I got overheated. But in the taxi on the way back, that sort of nice let down after exercise feeling, that endorphin kind of calm thing. And I look at my dot and it's beautiful. I get up to my hotel room and I'm admiring my dot and I take a shower with my hand outside <laughs> <laughs> and the dot come off. And I'm watching TV and I got a glass of wine and my dot is this brilliant purple. And I call my husband and he says, how are you doing? And I said, oh, my dot's purple. And he doesn't know what that means, but he's used to me saying things like that. And he goes, okay. And we start to talk, and he says, the cat's not feeling well. Now, we have the cutest kitten in the world. He's a little obsessed. And he started to freak out. The cat was not doing well. And some of this was my fault 3,000 miles away. And he's getting ups he's getting nervous. He's upset. Well, well I'm going to call that. And, 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 and I'm watching my dog, and I'm going, mm -mm. starting to fade. And it got this really cruddy green color. 
And then it started to go this gross yellow color. It started to go brown. And my husband's off on this tirade, not angry at me. I mean, we weren't fighting. He was just upset. And this was so fascinating to me because I realized his stress was affecting my dot. And I finally said, Michael, you know, I can't have this conversation with you right now. You're turning my dot black. So I'm going to talk to you tomorrow. And he's like, okay. I mean, again, having no idea. So I sit down and I do what's called a mini. And we'll do those in a little bit. And I open my eyes after just a minute. And my dot was purple. And I thought, wow, how sensitive are we as human beings if that silly five-minute conversation about the caffeine that could put me into such a stress response that it would completely turn my dog black. And then just a minute of quiet breathing could bring me back to this place of relaxation. So play with the dot today. They're really fun. You know, there's extras if you want to create people didn't come, so just grab those dots. I've given these to clients that are really fun. My husband doesn't believe in them at all. But we have made jokes of, I can't watch this presidential debate anymore. My dog's going black. So even if we're not wearing a dot, we now know what that means, that I'm going to start throwing things at the TV, so I should probably just leave. Okay, so why are we even talking about stress? Who cares, right? Anybody in here never felt stressed out? Okay, good. I'm in good company. Perfect. What We know it. We felt it. But what is stress? And the true definition of it is a feeling that what is happening outside of us, we perceive as being bigger than we can handle. We might be able to handle it perfectly fine, but our perception tells us we can't do this. This is too much for me. A threat real or imagined. And that's the part that I like, because so often we can't control the stress, right? And so often we're also kind of making up our own stress. We're fatalizing about things. We're, we're thinking thoughts. We're magnifying things. There's distortions that we need to deal with. We're going to talk about that a little bit, too. Why talk about it? It's estimated by numerous health professionals that about 70 to 80 percent of doctor visits are stress-related illnesses. So if we can decrease stress, or at least our response to it, how much healthier are we going to be? And stress also aggravates autoimmune conditions. And I'm sure you guys have all had a, a feeling where your, you know, your symptoms are maybe at this level, and the stress hits, and the, the symptoms increase, the joints get stiffer, the pain, the mobility. If we can get rid of that stress, if we can get rid of our reaction to that stress, how much more healthy are we going to be? Now, old stress. This was a needed response, right? There's a big thing chasing us. We have this fight or flight response. We have this cascade of hormones. Our heart and lungs increase so that we can flee or we can fight. We have this feeling of invincibility or fear as we run. And then after the danger passes, we would go to sleep. So we would have this peak of stress and then this relaxation. Well, the problem we face now is this is our new stress. We don't have a peak and then a drop off. We have stress. Whether it's a disease, whether it's doctor's appointments, whether it's a job, whether it's kids, whether it's husband got laid off, whether it's tax people, what, we have this constant level of stress. And I have so many clients who live this very type A, rush, 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 stress, that go, 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 go lifestyle. And when do they get sick? It's on vacation. Because they finally have that drop off when their body goes, look buddy, I've been fighting this cold for six months so that you can fight this war of what you call paperwork. I'm done. Every client I know that's stressed to the max gets sick on vacation. Christmas vacation, summer break, that one week off, that's when it happens. So let's see if we can't fix that. We're surrounded by body stressors. We have work stress, environmental stress, our food, our water. We can't control all the stuff that's being bombarded with us. But what can we do about stress? Okay? Let's have a little quiz. Anybody find that stressful who wants to jump on a plane? You want to jump on a plane? Most people are going to find it stressful. Anybody in here dispense skydiving? Am I the only insane person? I've been you, you've been? Excellent. I've been twice as well. I find this invigorating. We all have a different perception of stress. My husband would not do this. He stands on the ground and just hopes I don't go splat. But I find this exciting, and most people go, uh uh, I'm not doing that. How about this one? Anybody find this one stressful? Oh, yeah, I know. I don't mind bugs, but I don't want that on me, okay? To be very honest with you. Okay. How about this one? Okay, now we have multiple fears here. We got people don't want to be in water, people don't want to be in the ocean, people don't want to be scuba diving, and just kind of a shark. I don't like to swim with sharks, however, I want to be in a cage, not in a stick. Is <laughs> 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 a magic trick? Is it make it disappear? I don't know what he's doing. Okay, this one. Oh, everyone does that. Okay, anybody find this stressful? Okay, what if you're an asthmatic and your trigger's cat dander? It's going to terrify you. 
And what's fascinating about the placebo effect, which has been studied extensively now as a healing modality, if you give an asthmatic with cat as a trigger, that photo, they're going to start having an attack. If you give them a cloth and say, oh, here, there's cat dander on this, can you smell that for me? They're going to have an attack, even if it's not really cat dander. They're starting to find ways to use the placebo effect, not just as a way to, to piss off the drug companies because the drug doesn't work as well, but they're actually finding that they can use the placebo effect for healing. And they're doing things called open and closed trials where they'll turn to you and you'll be in the hospital, you'll be in pain, and they'll say, okay, we're going to give you a morphine injection. So in about five minutes, your pain's going to decrease. Let us know when you feel that. And they give you the injection. And in five minutes, the patient goes, wow, I feel my pain drop from an eight to a two. That's really neat, because they actually gave them the saline. But in seeing the injection and hearing that they're given placebo, their brain automatically starts to react, and they start to feel better. On the flip side of that, if they say, behind that curtain is a machine that at various times during the day is it actually going to give you morphine, you let us know when you feel better, they don't feel better. That thing's kicking out morphine and they don't even know. So how much better can we control pain? How much less pain meds could we use for things like surgery and pain management if we can actually tap into that placebo effect? Okay, now this next slide is Incredibly frightening. I can barely even look. I had one woman screaming and crying around the room last week when I did this talk. So everyone brace yourselves because this is scary side. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. I'm all right. My dog's black. That's okay. Okay. Now, I was audited by the IRS last year. <laughs> I don't write that. Okay. Um, now, what can we do about stress? Okay, there's so many things we can do. We can meditate, we can take a walk. Go for a ride, get a massage, play games, hang out with your spouse or your loved ones, pet your pet. I have two cats. They're the most relaxing things in the world because you can't be stressed when you've got a cat on your who's purring or a dog who's laying at your feet. They are the most incredible healing tools to me. And cognitive restructuring is something else we're going to talk about in a little bit. Um, but first, let's, let's talk about meditation. Does anybody here have a meditation practice? A couple of people. Excellent. This is going to be great. I'm not a good meditator. You can tell I talk very fast, I think very fast, and um, I'm from the East Coast, <laughs> I'm just not good at that meditation thing. And when I went to Harvard, they said, who meditates? And all these hands went up, and I kind of sat there going, oh, I'm not good at this. Okay. And again, one went, it's not a competition. Fine. Um, but they broke it down into something very simple. I, I felt that I couldn't clear my mind. My mind's a ticker tape. I mean, it's constantly going, right? To clear your mind, I can't. I, I can't. Here are the two rules of meditation that they told me, and I went, oh. Focus on something repetitive. Your breath, a word, a mantra, a sound. And when thoughts come through, not if, because they're going to, when thoughts come through, dismiss them without judgment, and let them pass on. And I thought, what, well, it's, it's okay for me to have thoughts? I just have to go, oh, I had a thought, bye, bye And let it keep going. I can do that. I can absolutely do that. And I could. And we meditate three, four, five times a day. Little one, two, five minute meditations. But I found that when we got to the end of the five minutes when they said, okay, let your regular thoughts come back, and I didn't want to. I didn't want to let those thoughts come back in. It felt so good to sit in that space and just watch them float by like clouds on a summer day and say, okay, I have a thought, bye bye, and go back to my breath and what I was thinking. So I want to give you guys the experience of what we call a mini. It takes a minute. So I'm going to have you guys get into a comfortable position. You can close your eyes if you want to. You don't have to, certainly. And what I want you to focus on is simply your breath. You can either focus on the rise and fall of your chest as you inhale and exhale, or the feeling of the air as it goes in and out of your nostrils. Just pick one of those and just see what your breath is doing. You don't have to change it. You don't have to affect it in any way. Just observe what it's doing and let it happen naturally. See if there's any place in your body you can let relax a little bit more. Are you holding an expression on your face? Are you holding your arms tight? Can you relax those legs? And just see what your breath feels like. Either the rise and fall of your chest or the feeling in your nostrils. And then on your next inhale, I want you to think, I am. And with every inhale, just let the words, I am. Next exhale, I want you to think at peace. So on the inhales, we're thinking I am. On the exhale, at peace. Just let the words 
flow through, there's no right way of doing it. And if a thought happens to come through, just acknowledge it and dismiss it without judgment because they're going to flow through. They actually flow through less the longer you do this. With the inhale, I am. With the exhale, at peace. Sometimes I say, I am pure health. I am pure joy. I am pure love. I am relaxed. You can say anything. Now what you're doing to your body as this is happening is you're lowering your blood pressure, you're lowering your heart rate, you're lowering your respiratory rate, you're strengthening your brain function, so you're actually more trying to learn, and you're slowing aging. I'll say that one again. Slowing aging. And it's so much cheaper than brain health. I am at peace. Just do that for a couple more times, then open your eyes and come back to the room. And
I, mean, I was starting to get upset about this. I was stressed, I was anxious. Write down any emotion that comes to mind with you when you do this. And here's the most important one, the thoughts. I'm never gonna get it rented. I'll be broke. I'm tired of other people's crap. We're stupid for buying it in the first place. Why does this keep happening to us? Now, these thoughts all sound familiar to you, right? Why does this keep happening to me? What, you know, this is stupid, I'm an idiot. Whatever, whatever the thought is, write it down. And then on that other piece of paper you guys have, it's the same little two page, are how we distort our thoughts. And once you read through those, you're actually gonna see a pattern of yourself emerge from those distortions. Saying things like always and never, that's a magnification. There is no always and never. Life is fluid, things change. But also just the simple statement of I'm never gonna get it rented. Really, never? I'm gonna go to my grave and there's gonna be an empty, uh, empty condo in Paso Robles. It'll never, ever again. That's ridiculous. And when you phrase it like that, you realize, oh come on, really? That's stupid. I'll be broke. Right, yes, I'm going to be living on the street with a shopping cart and no one to love me because I can't ever get this condo. I mean, again, that's ridiculous. Is it going to cost us money? Yeah. But the phrase, I'll be broke, is not a true statement. That's completely distorted. <coughs> that's all or nothing. That's fortune telling. Oh, I'm sure I know what happens in the future. You know what? We actually don't. I'm tired of other people's crap. It was one of my repetitive thoughts. That's a joke. I was comparing my situation to other people's situations. And again, as you read through these distortions, you're going to start to realize, oh, okay, I see what I lean towards. The all or nothing thing. The woe is me. How often do we woe is me? Um, I saw a great cartoon the other day. This woman sits down on a settee with her friend, and they get their tea, and she turns to her friend and goes, I can't wait to tell you everything was wrong in my life. <laughs> we do that. We get secondary gain from a lot of our problems. So are we woe is me about our issues? So after you write down your thoughts and you identify those distortions, you're actually going to find right off the bat you feel a lot better because you realize those thoughts aren't true. They are distorted. And then I was filling this out and I realized, well, you know, we've always, we've always gotten it rented before. And I went, oh, wait a minute. That's a good thing. We've been through this. We've always gotten it rented before. The other thing I realized, which even made it sound more ridiculous, is it had only been two weeks. It had been six months of sitting back. It had been two weeks. But because this was a stressor that came up again and again for me, it seemed like it had been longer because it was something I had to deal with over and over again. The next column, how would you like to feel? We all know how we'd like to feel. I wanted to feel in control. I wanted to feel financially secure. I wanted to feel calm about it. I didn't want to have this feeling of desperation so that if somebody walked in and said, hi, is your condo for rent, I wouldn't like start unpacking for them and you know, sign this, I'll pay you to move in and you know, I'll t homeless, no job, great, move in, we'll take you. you know, I didn't want to be desperate. That's how I wanted to feel. And I wanted to feel confident in my decisions and confident that I could get this property right here. Now, I'm talking about something that's, that's in the grand scheme of life, pretty meaningless. I mean, it's, it's a financial thing. It's a very material thing. But you can do this with anything. Any stress you're having that is that repetitive, keeps you up at night stress, you can do this. Now here's the second most important column, is the actions. On the list it's phrases, positive thoughts, it's not really what it is. Um, it's what can you actually do to put yourself in control of the situation. And I really thought about it, I said, what can I do? If we're seriously tired of dealing with this condo, we could lower the rent. We could accept Section 8 open up a whole other way of, of accepting people to move in. We could advertise in other places. We could hire a rental agency to do it for us. If I'm truly tired of spending weekends cleaning up other people's crap and cleaning the carpet and scrubbing the floors and cleaning up the shower, I'd hire a cleaning company. And just in realizing that I had these options, I went, hey, you know what? I am in control. And if worse comes to worse, we sell it. If it's that much of a Pain. And if it's that much of a hassle, if it's putting me into that sort of illness to get so stressed over it, get rid of it. And again, I, I also realize the positive things is I already, it always had been rented before. And it had only been two weeks, so that goes in the positive column also. But I have to tell you, when I started working with this form, I don't even need the form anymore. Because I can hear the thoughts, I go, oh, that's distorted. No, 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 no. We had the PowerPoint came late this morning. And me being the Capricorn, I play these slides, you know, very rigid in life. I, I sat down out there and I went, okay, if I don't have PowerPoint, I got a whiteboard. 
I can write this down on the, you know, it's not gonna, oh, ooh, that can't be the whole shark thing. Ooh, that's gonna be terrible. I mean, but, but it's like, what, it's not the end of the world. Why am I getting worked up and stressed over something that can, is easily fixed? And it was my distorted thoughts. It's not gonna be as good if I don't have fun pictures of cats and stuff like that. Um, but you'll find that the more you do this, the less you need to do it. It becomes a way of life. And when you can change those thoughts, it'll help the stress, it'll help your symptoms, and you're gonna find a better balance of your own stress. You're gonna spend less time stressed and more time doing the things you need to do for yourself, whether it's getting a massage, or getting in the hot tub or the pool, or taking a stroll with your spouse, or playing with a cat. Because if you're playing with the cat and you're stressed about this, you might as well not play with the cat. I mean, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna work. So take those, photocopy them, memorize them, use them. They're fabulous. Now, what else can we do? Let's ask for help. I'm terrible at asking for help, but I have learned <laughs> that it's okay for me to turn to my spouse and say, hey, honey, can you do blah, blah, blah for me? I'm really busy. Or calling a friend and saying, you know what, rather than me getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning and catching five buses, can you drive me to the airport? People want to help us. And it's so okay to ask for help. And we have to find a way in ourselves to do that. Because if not, what we start to do is we do this passive-aggressive thing. And I've had so many clients that I've found stay sick because of what they get from it. So rather than sitting down their spouse and saying, you know what, I really need you to help me cleaning, I have a gal who loves when her back goes out because her husband cleans. And I'm like, wow. Not that she's making her back go out, but she's not fixing the problem because she likes what she gets from it. She's holding on to that secondary game. And like Amy was talking about this morning, you know, is our illness us? What, what are we getting from it? She got amazingly positive opportunities from having to deal with this challenge that she had. But if you're holding on to it, it's becoming your identity of that woe is me, hey, um, I get stuff from this. It's so much easier to find a way to ask for help. And I actually sat this client down with the risk of losing her as a friend and a client, and I said, you know, I'm noticing that you seem happy when your back goes out because you get a lot of attention from that. She gets the big, strong men in the ambulance to come drive her to the hospital, and people come visit her, and she gets flowers, her husband cleans, and she gets to lay around the house. And she was starting to like that. And I said, do you think there's another way you can get that without the pain, the morphine, the doctor bill, the ambulance ride? And she said, yeah, I need to talk to my husband. And her back stopped going out. When she realized, no, I don't actually want the pain, I just want the attention, she found a positive way to get the attention. It's like kids that act out. You know? Mommy, 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 and then they start knocking things off shelves if you don't pay attention. <coughs> so learn to enlist the help of others. They will help you. I love the life love list. Um, you can do this anytime. Write down what you love to do. I love to dance. I grew up dancing. And I realized that once I moved to California, I didn't think adults danced. I thought that was what I did as a kid. My mom made me go. Um, and I suddenly realized after joining, you know, 15 gyms for the sheer privilege of not going and spending time going around. I didn't like working out. I went to curves, I did the dancing thing, and I, I still would rather be dancing. And randomly one day my husband said, oh, I was interviewing with the writer. He said, oh, I was interviewing this girl, and she said she does hip-hop dancing. And I went, oh, what was that? What? What hip-hop? I mean, I know what it is, but what, what? where is this? And I've been dancing five days a week since then. I'm in, the, I'm in rehearsal for a flash mob that we're doing at the weekend. But I realized I love it. And for 10 or 12 years, I didn't do it. I didn't let myself do it. So remember those things that you love to do and find a way to incorporate them back in. I'm not going to be able to do hip-hop forever. I can barely keep up with the 20-year-olds now. I do my best, and then I'm sore for a couple days, but I still think I'm 20. And at some point, I'm not going to be able to do that. I'm going to have to augment that activity to fit what my body will allow me to do. So if you stopped doing something because an illness won't let you do it, find a way to augment it. If you really like swimming, maybe you can do a water aerobics class. Maybe you can go on a boat and be on the water. Maybe there's, there's always things you can do to bring that love back into your life. And that's something that we have to have. It keeps us whole and who we are. Um, pie. Uh, sort of a tribute to Homer Simpson because he likes pie. Um, looking at the balance, that wheel of life, um, the pie, how much of our pie is taken up with work? or doctor's appointments, or taking care of the kids. Um, I've seen, I speak to a lot of women's groups, and we were told about 20 years ago that we can do it all, maybe only 15, 
And so we went, yay, we can do it all. And now we're trying to do it all. And we just can't do it all. We can't run the corporation and take care of the kids and take care of us and take care of, we can't. We can only keep so many balls in the air. And unfortunately, our cells is the glass one. And when that drops, it's hard to pick up the pieces on that one. Make your time pie. Make a big circle and see what parts of your life are taken up with these things other than yourself. And I like this because they put love in the middle. And I think that's self-love. That's love of family and friends. And I see so many people who have this much of the pie in work and this little sliver cut out for health and family and themselves. And it doesn't change anything, except it gives you a visual to go, whoa, I'm totally out of balance. I had a client who walked into my office and talking about the love aspect of this. She walked into my office and she said, my next one hurting me for 20 years, no one can help. Um, I don't even know why I'm here. I have half an hour, what can you do for me? <laughs> and I wanted to say, well, just give me the $40 and go home, because I frankly I can't really do anything. Uh, but I started working with her. And it turned out that she gave birth to a severely, severely brain damaged child who fortunately slash unfortunately survived. And she felt incredibly guilty about bringing this child into the world. The child was born in May, uh, March, sorry, and 18 years later, he passed away in May, so March and May, 30 years previously. Every March, she would haul herself up in the house to be depressed, and every May, she would emerge in more pain, malnourished. She scheduled, okay, time to be depressed, <clears throat> from something that happened decades earlier. She was still hanging on to this pain. She would only do a half hour massage, she would constantly say things like, oh, my stupid neck and my dumb neck, and I have to actually hold my head up. And, and I asked her at one point, I said, well, yeah, when does your, what, what hurts your neck the most? And she said, when I'm looking back. And I thought that was so telling. It's like, wow, that's, that's all you're doing is looking back. All you're doing is seeing that. She felt guilty that she birthed a child. She felt guilty that he died. And you can't change that. I couldn't help her change that. But one day, I was studying Louise Hay, who, I don't know if you guys know her, she's an amazing woman. She just had her like, 85th birthday and she looks 30, I mean, she's incredible. She was talking about looking in the mirror and saying, I love and accept myself just the way I am. I can do that, I mean, that seems, you know, you just look in the mirror and say that. It didn't seem challenging to me. And when she had expressed that people had difficulty with that, I thought, well, that's, that's weird, I, it seems normal to me to do that. Um, so I said to this client, I said, oh, you know, I've been working with this thing, and I, I I didn't say, I think you should try this. I said, hey, I'm doing this thing. What do you think about that? And I told her about it. She was, oh, jeez. Oh, oh, I could never do that. And I thought, what? You could never do that? And I said, what do you mean? And she was, oh, I don't, this whole 60s, you know, zen, love yourself thing. I don't get that. That's just, I don't even understand how you do that. And I said, well, but you come to see me, right? She said, yeah. I said, and you swim, right? She said, yeah. And I said, and you love baking, so you bake, right? She goes, yeah. And I said, you like bridge, so you play bridge, and you have fun with your husband, and you travel, and you eat right, you eat you know, organic stuff. She goes, yeah. And I said, all of that is self-love. And she was quiet for a second, and she said, oh my god, I just learned something from somebody half my age. And she started to laugh. She had no idea that Eating organic and swimming was self-love. She thought you had to stand in front of the mirror and say, I love and accept myself just the way I am. And by the time she stopped seeing me, she was not only able to do that, she no longer called her neck stupid. And as she'd swim, she'd think, my neck is strong, my neck is powerful, my neck is good. She was doing those affirmations, she was doing those mantras. And then she never came back. And I realized that the massage, whoa, it was kind of helping her. That's not why she was there. She was there in my office to learn about self-love and what she could do for herself in her time pie that was self-love. So now what else can we do? Okay, here's, here's the most powerful thing that I think you guys need to learn to do. No. <laughs> gotta say no. It's really hard because there's three motivating, I believe, and my husband believes, we talk about this all the time, there's three motivating factors. Guilt, fear, and love. 
Recently, we've thrown greed into that because of what's happening in the world. But guilt, fear, and love. How many times do we say yes because we're afraid someone's not going to like us, because we're afraid we're going to get fired, because we feel guilty that we should say yes because they said yes to us once, or just plain out of love because we do love the person we're home. But if we can't learn to say no, then what do our yeses mean? If everything is, yeah, I'll do that for you, does it hold any weight anymore? Do you find yourself resenting the fact that you agree to do something? I would rather say no and feel slightly guilty than say yes and resent that person or resent that forever. My challenge with this is if a client calls and they're in pain, I will skip whatever I need to to help them. That's a problem because I've watched my marriage suffer, I've watched my health suffer, um, and then people get used to that. Oh, what do you mean you can't squeeze me in? Well, I don't have any space to squeeze you in. Maybe it's because I actually don't have space, or maybe it's because I'm getting my own massage, or I'm taking a walk, or I have an event with my spouse, or I'm coming to speak to you people in Long Beach. Maybe, maybe I just need to say no because I just can't see one more person. Two Christmases ago, and I always I justify it. Oh, well, I'm going to be gone for a week, so I'm going to squeeze in as many people as I can. I scheduled nine massages in one day. Not okay. The seventh person walked in and I thought, okay, seven. And then the eighth came and I went, woo. And the ninth walked in and he said, hi, Kathy. And I burst into tears. And this is a big guy. He's not <laughs> your size. I could have maybe struggled through that. This is a big man. And I burst into tears and he said, oh my God, what's wrong? And I said, Jay, I can't touch one more person. I just can't do it. I hit a wall. And he goes, oh my God, you hit a wall. <laughs> and I went, no, 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 I hit a real wall. I just can't do it. And he goes, and he's a psychologist who does the same thing I do. He starts at six o'clock in the morning so he can see clients before he goes to school to be the school therapist, skips dinner to see clients, and he'll work till nine or 10 at night. And he looked at me and he goes, I've seen 12 people at all. Why don't we both go home? Why did I do not nine massages? Come on. I I should know better. I'm shooting, I'm shooting all over myself by saying that. Don't do that. But really, I never should have done it in the first place. And I resented seven and eight. They didn't do anything wrong. They simply said you have an opening. I, I said yes. And then I resented them for showing up in my office. That's so unfair. And did they get a good massage? Probably fine structurally. Was I there emotionally for them? No, I'm rubbing their feet and got my head down on the table. I was exhausted. I should not have said yes to that. So let's try an exercise here, okay? I want you guys to shout no. All right, you ready? I know you had other plans, but can you drive the carpool this morning? Because I don't want to. No. no. Um, so I know you have a wedding to go to, but can you work late for me? No. Can you take out the trash? No. Can I have 20 bucks? No. It's hard. <laughs> no one's going to give me any money. <laughs> but use that. Because again, like I said, if you say yes to everything, then what, is, what does it mean? What does it stand for? Say your yeses for really special things. Okay. I'm going to allow some time for questions, and then we have a uh, survey to fill out. So if you take nothing away from this, I hope that you'll start to do minis. To me, that is just, that's really changed so much. And how hard was that? I mean, it was, did anyone have trouble doing that? I, it's so simple. I actually got my dad doing it. Okay, he'd rather be bowling. Okay, but I got to this is great. Um, relax, me meditate, use the other tools. Learn to say no, and also call me if you need anything. I put my business card on all the chairs. You can email me, you can call me. If you go to my website and sign up for my newsletter, um, I actually do a monthly newsletter. I don't bug you with stuff, just go up to monthly with a newsletter. Last month I did Reiki, I've done really bad things about flower essences. I think this next one I'm gonna do is either on how to stay, healthy this flu season, or boosting your energy naturally. I haven't decided which one to do yet. And, and again, I have books here. Um, I do my massage DVD for any of the caregivers that want to learn how to do massage safely on their, on their partner. And then have a fabulous day and enjoy the conference. I'm speaking again in this room at 2.15 with Carolyn. We're going to talk about alternative remedies um, for pain management. So talk about things like Reiki and Bach flower essences and stuff like that. And then um, if you need anything, let me know. Thank you guys so much.